visit us. Take us from glory to glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you so much. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. This weekend, we are dealing with, with the subject of new heights with the most high. We are talking about growth. We are talking about development. We are talking about a new encounter with the Lord. We are talking about a new dimension. We are talking about the touch of the Lord. We are talking about being who God has ordained for you to be. We are talking about you no longer operating at the surface level, but a higher level. The Lord will take you up to that higher level in Jesus' name. I'm talking about reposition for revival and divine turn around. The Lord will reposition you in Jesus' name. Because when you are revived, things turn around. Things are done different. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, I look at it from verses 1 to 7, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. In the year that the king I, Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne upon a throne, high and lifted up, mark that word, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the, the, the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. I need an amen there. Yeah. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this had touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is touched. You know, we spoke about life virus earlier on, but now it's about life coal from the very altar of the Lord. The seraphims that were crying, the Bible tells us in verse 3 that they were crying one to another, holy, holy, holy. When you get to whatever level you are right now, to another level, higher level, level of holiness and righteousness, level of purity and uprightness, then all your vision, all your desire, all your aspiration will be holiness. Your son will be holiness. And then it will be holiness unto the Lord will be our watch, world, and song. Holiness unto the Lord as we are marching on. As you get into this new encounter and relationship with the Lord, all the things of the world that clouds your brow will fade away at the presence of the Lord. There is a position that man automatically finds himself by virtue of the nature of Adam. That is the nature of sin. But when you repent of that sin, you confess it unto the Lord, you become a new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You are now beginning to operate at a different level. A different level. David said in the book of Psalm 51, in verse 5, he said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin 
did my mother conceive me. In order for you to get to this new height we are talking about, praise God for those of you that are born again, but what level of that relationship with God are you? New height with the most high. What level are you in your work? In every family, we have the babes. We have the toddlers. We have children. We have the youth. You have, we have the teenagers, the young adults. And then we have the fathers and the mothers. And then we have uh, people that are adult but not yet married. What level are you? Now, that is about age. There are people also that their maturity level does not necessarily depend upon their age. Yes, they may have a number of uh, years upon their life, but they are still like children. They act like children. They talk like children. They behave like children. And the Lord is saying, come up high. You have been around this mountain for too long. You have been a member of the church for so long. And you just come in and you go. And there is nothing we can really say that you add to the church other than just being a member. And the Lord is saying, come up high. Or maybe you are even a worker. And today we see you. Tomorrow we do not see you. The Lord is saying, come up high. For you to be able to come up high, you have to get to a point of self-dissatisfaction with your current state. If you are not dissatisfied with your current level, your current stage of position, you'll never seek for a better position. If you are not dissatisfied with your current job, you'll not look for another job, a, uh, a better job. And the Lord, they say, there is something better than the level where you are right now. And you are a worker. The Lord wants you to be a better one. That cannot be until there is revival. And the Lord will revive you, revive me, revive all of us together in Jesus' name. In the book of Psalm 85, the Bible tells us there, in the sixth verse, it says, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice? When there is that revival, I call it spiritual awakening, there is joy within. Within yourself, there is joy. And people around you, there will be joy as well. Many people want that revival, but few people actually seize it. Many ask for revival, but few people pray for it. There are a lot of shouting and singing, a lot of music and sermon, a lot of prayer, but few purity, a lot of media, but few meditation. A lot of singing, but few sorrowing for sin. A lot of pop-ups or popping up, but few power. The power of the Holy Ghost. Many pride in their churches, but God is not proud of them. The Lord is calling you to look inward. Look at yourself. Ask yourself, where am I in my work with the Lord? The Lord wants you to come up high. New height with the most high. The Lord will take you there in Jesus' name. There are people that have left their old churches to come to our church, but they have not left their old life. They left Egypt, but Egypt has not left them. The Lord is calling you to a new work with him, a new relationship with him. Ezekiel chapter 37, I look at it from verse 7. Ezekiel 37, from verse 7. So I prophesied. As I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. I pray that today there will be a shaking in the house in Jesus' name. Whether you are watching online or you are here in person, I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will reach out unto you. The power of the Lord will touch you and do something uh, dramatic in your life in Jesus' name. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. I pray that your nakedness will be covered up. I need a better one. And the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, 
prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O bread, and breathe upon this slave. Stop right there. When your life is not where it ought to be, when you are not growing the way you ought to grow, or when you have a stunted growth, it's because something is wrong in your system. Something is wrong with your life. And the Lord will take away that which is wrong because you have been slain. Whether spiritually slain, matrimonially slain, um, socially slain, financially slain, whatever kind of attack in your life, the Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. O oh, bread, and breathe upon this slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the bread came unto them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. God will raise you up an army for him. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1, I look at it from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. Ah. Sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. Stop right there. When I was ministering yesterday to the leaders, I told them that uh, when there is a correction. The, uh, you call it discipline. The purpose of discipline is for a change, a correction, to make things right. And I said that if you get discipline for something and there is no change, I will withdraw that discipline. Because it's like you are a bastard. It doesn't matter to you. It's like you don't care. It's like the fear of God is not there. Uh, it's like uh, the spirit of God is not controlling you. I tell people that every human being in life is under the control of one out of two spirits. It's either the Holy Spirit of God or an evil spirit. And so when there is rebellion, when there is stubbornness, and the Bible says that rebellion, stubbornness are actually like the sin of witchcraft, so we can just conclude that you are operating under a different spirit, and that, that correction will not help because you do more. Come back to this book of Isaiah, verse 5. It says, why should you be stricken anymore? You will do what? Revolt more and more. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. It says the whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises, and the put uh, putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Verse 7. Your country is desolate. Your cities are born with fire. Your land, strangers devoid in your presence. Your land, your family, your soul, your spiritual life, your relationship with the Lord. That is your life, that is your land, that is your possession. Strangers, the enemy, devoid in your presence. And it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. And the daughters of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of Kokumba, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts has left us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. The Lord is calling, you, calling us to spiritual awakening. To awake and get reposition to God's level of expectation, there be need for revival. The question is, what is revival? Revival is hope springing up in the place of hopelessness. Revival is spiritual life of blossoming after periods of spiritual coldness and death. Revival is the zeal, the passion, and the consecration replacing inactivity or lack of interest in spiritual matters, especially among the people of God. Revival is 
when the Lord makes us to be heavenly minded rather than being absorbed by or in the things of this world. It is genuine repentance from our sin, self, and arrogance. Some people, they don't understand their level, that they are cold, that they are lukewarm, that God is about to spew them out. And they think religion is the order of the day. No. Revival ushers in an era of genuine conversion. And that is why in our churches, when we sing, let us sing songs that will connect us with heaven. When we minister, let us minister messages that will prepare people for heaven. If we just want crowd in the church, the crowd will come. But where are we taking them to? If we gather the kind of a crowd that is all about sentiment, it's all about activity, it's all about uh, fun fear, and at the end of the day, everybody ends up in hellfire, then we have labored in vain. I pray we will not labor in vain in Jesus' name. So when there is revival, it ushers in genuine conversion. It ushers in real commitment and consecration unto the Lord. And among clear evidences of revival and renewal, a passion for God and hunger, as well as thirst for holiness, for humility, and for heaven. The religious spirits are determined to build the church in America, spirit of religion, spirit of religion. And they comfort themselves in, yeah, the same Christian song. They preach and they teach. But the question is, where is the lie? They have the form of godliness, but deny the power bearing. They want to build the church on the foundation of prosperity. They want to build the church on the foundation of paraphernalia, of public showmanship. They want to build the church upon the foundation of prophecy, miracle signs and wonders. Why we believe in miracles, we believe in signs and wonders. But the church of Christ must be built upon the word of God, must be built upon holiness and righteousness, upon purity and uprightness. The religious spirits of this age, which are taking over this land, this nation, has inspired the entire range of churches on how to pioneer lukewarm churches based on programs rather than the apostolic power of the Holy Ghost. I pray the Lord will visit us in Jesus' name. The Lord is selling this church, this church, deeper life Bible church in the nation of America, to come up higher. The Lord is telling you as an individual to come up higher. The Lord is telling you to get out of your lukewarm state and be side by side with the Lord. You know, Isaiah that we read about in chapter 6 had been in the Lord, so to say. Not just in the Lord, a minister, so to say. He has been doing things, but at a certain level. But it got to a point when the eyes of Isaiah was open, and he had that vision, and he saw that revelation, and he saw the Lord in his holy tabernacle, the perception of Isaiah changed. And the, the, the vision of Isaiah changed. The desire and the passion changed. Everything changed. And then Isaiah began to desire God and God alone. May God be your number one desire in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, one of the, uh, my mentors in this area, uh, of course, our father in the Lord, number one. But then there are other people I read about. I study their life. And one of them is Leonard Ravenhill. I don't know if you have read about him. If not, get any of his material, read, and your life will not remain the same. He wrote a book, Sodom Had No Bible, Leonard Ravenhill. He wrote the book about another Pentecost. We need another Pentecost, and the Lord will give unto us in Jesus' name. And so, in one of his writings, Leonard said, We talk apostolic doctrine, but lack apostolic deeds. 
with claim apostolic faith, but lack apostolic fruit. Some trumpet apostolic power, but lack apostolic poverty. Some claim apostolic endowment, but lack apostolic accomplishment. We may have apostolic vocabulary, do we have apostolic victory? Many claim apostolic succession, few, if any, desire. Uh, few, if any, dare claim apostolic success. The Lord will help us. I want to say again, Psalm 85, verse 6, we thou not revive us. Again, that thy people may rejoice. The Lord will revive us. The Lord will revive us. Psalm 80, from verse 1, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, Thou that leadest Joseph like a flower, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh stir up thy strength, come and save us. And that will be our prayer today. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O oh Lord, God of hosts, how long will thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strive unto our neighbor, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Turn us again, O oh God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Understand? The children of Israel, the Lord visited them in Egypt when they cried unto him. The Lord brought them out by a strong and mighty hand. And they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were fed with angels' food. They drank water from the rock of God. Of course, we know that rock was Christ Jesus, the very source of the living water. And the Bible says, with all of those, with many of them, God was not pleased. They perished in the wilderness. I pray you will not perish in the wilderness. The Lord will turn things around for you in Jesus' name. So the Lord is speaking to you, speaking to me, speaking to every one of us. As I talk on my first point, confirmation of wrong, worthless wrong or worthless position and the need for repositioning confirmation of worthless position which is a wrong position and the need for repositioning number two condition for what the positioning with the most high condition for what the positioning with the most high number three consequences of wondrous position with the most high. The consequences, what happened? When your situation changed, what happened? When your life changed, what happened? When you line up with God, what happened? When you step, step up and you go up higher to a new high to be on the level of God, that says, be ye holy, for I am holy. The level of God that says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. When you get to that point, what will happen in your life will be amazing. Come back to the first point. Confirmation, evidences of worthless position and the need for repositioning. Don't tell me I'm a pastor. Don't tell me I'm a worker. I'm a deacon. Don't tell me I've been in the Lord for so long a time. Where are you now in your relationship with the Lord? And if you are not up there with the Lord, completely dead to the world, your eyes shut to the things of the world, your passion for the things of the world completely gone, then you are none of these yet. You may have the head knowledge, you may have the church experience, you may have the title, but if God cannot look at you, 
the way he looked at Enoch. The Bible said that Enoch walked with God and he was not. He was not because he walked with God and God took him away. If God cannot walk side by side with you, the way he walked with Enoch, if God cannot talk side uh, mouth to mouth with you, the way he spoke with Abraham, the way he spoke with Moses, then you are not there yet. Anything and everything you may be laying hold to, laying claim to, a vanity upon vanity, and everything becomes vanity. Him. And uh, when you now want to continue to do things the old way, those will be hindrances to revival. So let's see what some people have to put together. And of course, I put some together myself in order for us to have a turning point, in order for us to have a turnaround. And so understand when there is rationalization of sin in the church, there is need for rev revival. When sinners and backsliders are easily accommodated, we just take them in and come as you are and say as you came, there is need for revival. When everybody does what seems right in their own eyes, in the church of God, there is need for revival. When it says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, he wants us to come so that he can change us, turn us around, transform us, and make us become the way he wants us to be. Not that we came in and remain the same way we came. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I need a better one. When, uh, when there is no regard for the word of God in the church, when we have lost our first love for God, when we do not love him as we once did, when religion is multiplying at the expense of righteousness and holiness and purity, there is need for revival in the church. Why well, you cannot correct a believer anymore without them getting angry, without them threatening to leave and to drop the wall and walk away, then there is need for revival, for revival when believers no longer see the need for restitution. There is need for revival in the church. Uh, when sins are not courageously dealt with, you see a sinner, you see somebody who is not living right, but if I talk, they will leave. If you do this, they'll be offended. Who are you fooling? Is this your work? Are you the one building the church of God? Is this your church or the church of God? You are a laborer. You are not the owner of the world. And if there is a rule, a condition that must be met in doing it, why don't you do it and please the one that hired you? Why will you be afraid of the person you have to work on instead of the one that sent you? I pray things will turn around in our churches in Jesus' name. We will deal with sin. And we will not tolerate sin in Jesus' name. We need revival in our churches. When the fear of man and the respect of persons turns the judgment turns judgment upside down because of position title, or maybe that person is the one financing your church, and because of that, you shut your mouth, you close your eyes, you turn the other way. We need revival in the church that the Lord will visit his church again in Jesus' name. When earthly interests and occupations are more important to us than eternal business, the business of God, the work of soul winning. You know, there are people, they will tell you, because of coronavirus, they cannot come to church. But coronavirus is there, they go to the store. Coronavirus is there, they go to their job. Coronavirus is there, they are able to go to other places where they cannot come because coronavirus is the church of the living God. They need revival. Something is wrong with them. They do not know that uh, they have become like Ephraim. They are unveiled. The enemy has attacked them. The Lord will deliver them in Jesus' name. We need revival when we would rather watch television and read secular books and magazines than read the Word of God, Bible, and then pray, and then pray. And in one of the writings of Leonard Raven Hill again, he said, he that is not praying is playing. And may I tell you this, if you have no altar for God in your life, the world will alter your life. 
the demons will alter your life. They will alter your family. They will alter everything about you. And so you need re revival. Revival of holiness. Revival is not uh, we come, we sing, we song, we come, we dance, we, we, we scream and shout, uh, and then we bind the devil. That is not the real revival. That is not the real revival. The revival that I know of is if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, I see that in our churches today, we talk more about the devil. We are more afraid of Satan and demons and evil spirits than we are afraid of God. And we pray against them all the time instead of us praying and saying, Oh Lord, turn my life around. Make me to be who you really want me to be. You be that person. And then you know that there is a wall of fire around about you. That no devil, no demon, no principality, or no power, uh, and no power can come near you in Jesus' name. And so we need to pray. We need to pray. Again, not the kind of prayer that people are praying today. Uh, 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 online prayer here, online prayer here, online prayer there. That's not the need, the kind of prayer. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that you go before the Lord. You fall upon your face. You cry unto the Lord like Isaiah did and say, Oh Lord, I am wretched. I am poor. I am undone. I need your help. That is prayer. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that Abraham prayed and he knew destruction was coming upon a land. Abraham did not call Lot. Abraham did not even call the members of his family to say, let us have family gathering together. That was not the kind of prayer. I'm talking about the kind of prayer that took Jesus into the wilderness and then for 40 days and 40 nights he waited upon the Lord. He cried unto the Lord. That is the kind of prayer that we are talking about. I'm talking about the kind of prayer of Jeremiah. I'm talking about the pray, the kind of prayer of Paul the Apostle, the kind of prayer of Peter. I'm talking about real prayer. If you don't pray anymore, some of us now on your own, pray. Five minutes, you're already snoring. You're already dozing. You can spend one hour in prayer, two hours in prayer, three hours in prayer, and all you do is, uh, one day say, let us pray. Can you have a need in your life? a problem in your life and uh, a blemish in your life and you go to the public and say oh everybody hear me oh i committed immorality yesterday oh god forgive you is that the way you get forgiveness is that the way you get pardon unto this man will i know unto this man that 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 that, that, that trembles at my word and uh, uh, is contrite at heart. Uh, that is in the book of Isaiah chapter 66, uh, uh, verses 2 and 3. He said, unto that will I look. And then we are told in uh, Psalm 51, 